This is the Be Better Broadcast. I'm Brandon Eastman. I'm here today with Brian Brody for the second time for a very special occasion because, Brian, yesterday was the 37th anniversary of your father's suicide. It was. It was. And I, I will say, Brandon, that every year on the anniversary, uh, as I may have mentioned yesterday, I, I don't pick New Year's Eve for resolutions. I, I save uh, the the 16th for revolutions. Like, what can I do to revolutionize? What can I do to clear the air? What can I do to draw the line in the sand so that people have a better understanding of just the whole concept? Not so much a biological suicide. Yes, I just got off a little bit ago, uh, just moments ago, with a father who uh, lost his son uh, just recently to suicide. So, but the biological suicide is one thing, and I'm sure you would echo this. You would say, look, if it's, if it's something that you're seriously contemplating, call uh, the suicide hotline, which I manned for years, brother, after my father's suicide. That was, I thought that's how I could give back, was manning the suicide uh, hotline. But if it's something you're contemplating and you need that person to talk to, reach out to a doctor, reach out to a shrink, reach out to a therapist, reach out uh, to the suicide prevention hotline and just talk to them about it. But if you and I focus on the philosophical suicide, what I believe to be the precursor to ultimately thinking it would be a great idea to take your own life, then I think we can do good for folks that would never contemplate suicide and and leave the you know the other uh, professionals that people that are considering the biological end of it that they could address with trained professionals. Absolutely. And I'm I'm excited to chat with you because you've spent the greater part of your life on this journey to really understand and dive deep into philosophical suicide, what that looks like. And it, it interested me yesterday because you look at that that photo of your father's gravestone. And right, right here in the right here in the yeah, studio. You got it with you now. Yep, yeah, it's it always with me all the time. When I come down to sit at the computer, brother, it's right there because it remind you know what it really reminds me, buddy? This is gonna be me soon. Yeah. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, but it's six. I've celebrated my 50th birth uh, birthday like 13 times now. So I'm up there, right? I'm up there in years, but you have to live every moment uh, like it's your last. And that's why I saved the picture. Yes. And what I noticed when I looked at that picture is we, during the teaser yesterday, announcing today's conversation together, we talked about how suicide is the the leading cause of death in the United mm -hmm. States for individuals between the ages of 18 and 24. But what was very interesting to me, and I didn't think about this during our conversation, your father was 61 years old when mm. what? Yeah, right. So he's, he's outside of that range. He's a, not only is he outside of that range, let's, uh, for the interest, since you brought it up, let's be honest, I've celebrated my 50th birthday uh, 11 times. I'm 61 years old. So this <laughs> wow. year, Brandon, it brought to me that at this age, my father thought it best to open a 13-story window and jump out of that window. At my age, brother. So I feel, right, like all the time I feel like a juvenile. I don't feel like I'm 61 years old. But this was the age. And as we mentioned yesterday, I had a cousin, stunningly beautiful, head of the cheerleading uh, squad at our high school, come home, hang herself in the closet. I had a best friend who decided to pull his car. A brilliant guy. Pull his car into the garage, shut the door, and let his uh, vehicle do the dirty work for him. So for me, a part of it is like, is there a genetic concept to it, right? Which is what I started studying right after my father jumped. Could I be prone to that? And it's interesting that you say 61 because I'm the same age. Uh, so yesterday, same age, um, I would have jumped. And your father, was was he a World War II veteran? He was a veteran and, uh, and a medic. And uh, highly decorated and the like, and uh, but and only because you ask, I didn't have the best relationship with my father, which ultimately didn't block me, Brandon, from the PTSD after he left a note saying that the reason he committed suicide was that his oldest son had shunned him. To to be painfully, painfully honest with you, uh, Christmas before he called me. And uh, my my father, God uh, love his soul, was uh, a, a physically abusive alcoholic. So I had a lot of years growing up, right? <laughs> like if anyone deserves to smack their inner child around, it's me. I, I have a, a, a wounded inner child from my interaction with an Irish, overly aggressive alcoholic father. So Christmas before he jumped, he called, and I just wasn't ready to bury the hatch. I hadn't spoken to him in years. 
I wasn't ready to bury the hatchet. And well, it's like 21 days later, after having not taken his call, uh, 21 days later, uh, he jumped. So when I talk about the PTSD, when I talk about the guilt and the shame, at that time, I believed that I shared some of the responsibility for his suicide. Now, we all know that that's not the case, but it took me years to get to that point, brother, where, where I realized in studying comparative religion, comparative philosophy, psychology, quantum physics, math, the classics, all of it, to try to figure out when he jumped from that 13-story window, in the last 10 feet before he hit the sidewalk, was there rejoice or regret in his decision? And so, yeah, at 61 years old, I, I, for the longest time, I carried a good bit of guilt. And for those listening who have suffered through a family member committing suicide, it, it, they will probably tell you the same thing as I just did, that we're not responsible. Uh, I said to my wife that it, 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 had I moved in with him and kept him every day from running with scissors, maybe. But if not, my father would have found another way if it weren't that particular way. Once the mind makes that decision, it's etched in stone, right? There's very little that can turn it around. Uh, and that's if you read the accounts of people that have jumped from the Golden Gate Bridge and survived and rejoice at the thought of life. Yeah. Up until that point, there's very little you can do about it. Yeah, a lot of people who attempt to take their life but survive, like you mentioned, go on to say, I'm glad that I'm still okay, here. Yeah. Right? And they, they learn a lot from that experience. And you're only on the journey you're on because your father made the choice that he made, right? So in a way, your father helped a lot of people by that choice. However, well, thanks, brother. you know, it, it doesn't always work out that way, right? Every every action yeah. has a reaction of some sort. And in this That's case, that reaction has led you to help so many other people understand this idea of philosophical suicide. That idea that you mentioned of regret or rejoice during that time of really no turning back, right? While not right. to get graphic, but there is a disclaimer, this episode can and will get graphic at some points, but the individual who does hang themselves and they're hanging there in that moment before they lose consciousness, like what you mentioned, do they regret their choice yeah. or are they rejoicing in the choice they made? Your father, as he was falling through the air, did he think in his mind, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that or I'm glad that I did that? Is there any finding an answer to that question of regret or rejoice and, and how, what have you discovered in that journey of, of looking for it? Well, I should say that uh, for those that aren't terribly familiar, I know you are, brother, but for those that aren't, uh, and I don't know why you would be with my life history, but I was a criminal investigator in a police department in New York. So in dealing with the guilt and dealing with my own level of PTSD, I, I decided to resign from the only job, right, appointments to the uh, a military academy that I didn't take. I went into uh, the, the military. I went into the Air Force. I got out, graduated number one in all those academies, got out, went to the civilian uh, police academy, graduated number one there. So by the time this happened, I was digging the fact that I was a criminal investigator. And, and I'll never forget a particular day that, and I won't say his name because I didn't ask him if it was okay, but I responded to a crime scene where there was a sergeant uh, looking around the crime scene and I got there. And I remember him saying to me, whenever a bad guy or a bad girl, right, takes something from a crime scene, they leave something behind. And I was mesmerized by this guy. I was mesmerized by the fact that he said, all you have to do, Bri, is figure out how to be smart enough how to mentally, acuity, how to be visually smart enough to figure out what the criminal left behind. So when I resigned from the police department 37 years ago, it was with the only real formal training I had, Brandon, was to investigate, right, as a detective. And when I say I read all these books, I did all these studies, I, 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 I mean, as far away as sitting in a cave on Wudong Mountain in China, mm -hmm. uh, I've, all over the place, to try to figure out that very question. And and I know it's a long answer, but I would say what's been most helpful for me, my belief is it's regret. Now you could say, well, Brian, your belief isn't worth anything. And that's absolutely true. But having read the accounts of the people that jumped and survived, people that tried to kill themselves, seriously tried to kill themselves and survived, that they were glad that they weren't able to finally tap out. I rely on their stories to bolster my belief that in those final seconds before you lose consciousness, it's more 
of a regret in the decision that you made to take your own life than it is rejoicing that the pain is over. And I'm thrilled today to be able to talk to you about the yeah. source of that pain, right? But we'll get to that. But yeah. I think it's more uh, uh, buoyed by the books and the accounts that I've read from people that have attempted. I think it's more, uh, it's more regret. They're not rejoicing in their decision at all. Yeah, absolutely. And our our purpose together is to really talk about, well, what does make life worth living? And we had our conversation on the broadcast about the importance of this moment is the only moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking 20 years ahead is great, but really, what are you doing now, right, in order to be fulfilled, in order to find purpose in your life? And I found a lot of I enjoyed our conversation because it helped me personally because I'm I'm this forward thinking person always thinking forward always thinking forward learn from the mistake keep looking forward but if you keep looking forward you you fail to look around at where you are now and then you look back and you're like well what happened right and right, I know right. there's a lot of people speaking of this idea that I haven't heard about until we had a conversation about philosophical suicide versus biological biological is when you the body is no longer useful. It's, it's done. You've, you've ended your physical life, whatever you might believe. But philosophical suicide is something very different. How, how do you define philosophical suicide and, and how did you come across that term? Well, just in reading all the accounts, and I know people will say, well, it's, it's, it's terribly stoic of Brian. We joked yesterday that I was probably born a stoic, right? To believe it as wholeheartedly as I do. Maybe like 95% nature, 5% nurture. Who knows? But for me... The idea of a philosophical suicide as being the precursor, and I said yesterday that my father was dead long uh, before he hit the curb, right? And my father, his decision to end his life was something where his own mind turned against him. So if you go all the way back, you know, you have some therapists today, uh, Dr. Stutz being one of them, some really brilliant minds. He's written a book called The Tools, but he talks about that. I, I think he, the term he uses, if I remember, is higher authority. But for me... And how we can all get to a common ground, right? As kindred, how we can all get there. Whether you believe in the Big Bang or the Big Breath, whether you believe we walked off the savannas of Africa or were evicted from the Garden of Eden, I couldn't care less about that belief. What I do care is that moment that our ancestors took that first step, science or religion, right? Whatever you believe, there still is a common ground. And it was in that first step. So if you look back, when I say whatever, however you define the divine, that inner authority, which I happen to call the alpha, we'll get to what happens to the alpha as you move on uh, through life, but that inner authority, you are a great, 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 great grandchild of the divine, however you define it. Hmm. So that inner authority remains in you. Now, it may be what I call human gettingness. The, the opposite of human being, that inner authority remains within the human being. But is a human getting, right? I, I, the question I ask people, how is it with Amazon, where you and I can get all the opulence, right? All the accoutrement, every bobble, every bling, every knickknack that we could possibly want, and it'll be delivered before the show's over. If you hear the doorbell <laughs> ring, it's because I ordered something else and from robots Amazon. will deliver it. A robot will deliver it. Drones yeah. will fall from the sky with your crap, right? You get all the stuff that you could possibly want, all the accoutrement, all the baggage, how is it that in this day and age where you literally can get anything you want, we have the highest rates of drug addiction. We have the highest rates of depression. We have the highest rates of suicide. Forget midlife crisis. It's even now a quarter life crisis. How is it, given our ability to get, get, get the consumer mindset, get, how is it that so many people can, they're filling their hearts content how many can people can feel that their heart is broken? And what's, what's the harm in that? The idea of being able to order something, getting it immediately, being able to have instant gratification on most everything that it is that you want. What is the harm in that that can lead to that philosophical suicide? Well, the, the harm is that it can be taken away instantly. You can wreck your brand new Lamborghini. Your house can be burglarized and all your big screen TVs are gone. Uh, you know, whatever the bling is from the outside can always be taken from us. But what can't be taken from you is that in, in the Hebrew Bible, they call it ruach, R-U-A-H. And it's the breath of God that blows across the waters. I tend to think of it as the breath of the divine. That breath that's stored within you is the alpha, 
male or female. Everyone says, oh, you're, you're, you're implying that it's only male. I'm not. Alpha, that shows you know nothing of the term. A, a male and a female are both equally capable of being an alpha. And that's what we talked yesterday about, being the conduit to channel your destiny. But then all this getting this, we kind of, it's like plaque in the artery, right? Eat too many double, triple cheeseburgers, uh, guacamole, and I'm going to out myself if I keep up with the menu, right? To all the beef, <laughs> special sauce, lizard cheese, pickles, onions, on a sesame seed bun, right? So you keep taking in all the stuff. Well, it makes plaque in your arteries. You keep subscribing to a life of getting this. It's mental plaque. It's mm. cognitive cellulite, if you will. And that keeps you from hearing that still small voice, that ruach, that breath of the divine, that alpha that's in you. That's why I think it's so important to go, great, bling's great. And I got plenty of bling. I'm sitting in a room full of bling. You're sitting in a room full of bling. But there comes a time when we stand up and the lights go down and the cameras go off. You have to be perfectly content with who you are as a human being, knowing that if it all stopped tomorrow, all the getting this, all the consumerism, if it all ended crashing down tomorrow, would you go, <laughs> I can build it again, <laughs> right? What am I going to worry about? I can do it again. And that's uh, that's what I think is the difference between the two mindsets. So let's let's talk to that person. And I got a couple different variations of this question relating to your father, but also <laughs> relating to the, the young people who are experiencing that quarter life crisis of they're saying, you know, I just don't feel great about my life. I wonder what it would be like to not be living, like things aren't going the way I thought it would, monkey wrench thrown here, wrench thrown here. What would you say to that individual who says, and they're open about it and they and they come out to you and they say, Brian, I'm having a really rough time. What can I do in order to sweeten my experience of life? Oh, and this, and let me just say this before I answer the question, uh, I'm going to shelter you from this. Uh, the views expressed here are Brian's, has nothing to do with Brandon's views, be better or anything else, right? Because you're going to get all kinds of hate mail. When someone comes to me and say, oh, I'm having a rough day, I, I, my first inclination after all these years of study is good for you, <laughs> right? Good for you. And they, and they step back and I go, look, I wish you nothing but a year full of pain. Wow. And they go, whoa, whoa, did I just tell you how bad I'm hurting? And I go, great. I, I wish you two more scoops. Why? Because we've been taught to believe that pain is a bad thing. And all pain is, right, Brendan, like if you're sharpening your knives or you're sharpening an axe, you need a whetstone to grind that blade against to make it sharp. So our pain, all those things that are so rough on us, what if, what if, what if, those things are there to teach us to be sharper? to teach us to rise above them, to teach us to be better, to be stronger. And think about it. You came from the gym this morning. If it weren't for the pain of doing a bicep curl, if it weren't for the lactic acid building up inside of your muscles, you wouldn't be able to do a push-up tomorrow morning. Yeah, It's that pain in the physical body that builds strength. And I would offer that the reason I say, I am so glad to hear that today was rough for you, one, because you want them to know that you're listening. So many people, here's the thing, brother. And again, right, just Brian, not Brandon, not be better, because people are going to complain. Some people go, oh, well, I just really needed someone to listen. No, you didn't. You needed to make sure that they were hearing what you said. But just listening when someone goes, oh, I'm really sorry, it'll get better. Well, if you're a mind that believes that it won't get better, what possible good is it to talk again Right? What, what I, I find no, I find it hard to believe that there's good talking to someone to say, oh, it'll be better. It may not. It may suck more. And I know it's terribly military of it, but uh, I took the term embrace the suck and I turned it into what I do is called out brutal the brutal. How am I going to get up every day? My eyes open in the morning. Within five seconds, my feet are on the floor. Within two minutes, I'm in a cold shower. Within 30 minutes, I'm sitting downstairs meditating for 20 minutes. For me, I want that sense of discomfort because it reminds me that if I can do 10 pull-ups today, I'll be able to do 15 pull-ups maybe by next week mm. because of the pain. And I think we've been taught to run from pain. I think we're put here to go, no, I'm the sharpest knife in the drawer. You're the sharpest knife in the drawer. And what if our pain, what if our obstacles are our oracles? Yeah. Right? What if our trauma is our teacher? 
But we've been taught to run from it for such a long period of time that we're, you know, people say, oh, I have a fear of this or a fear of that. Well, what if that fear is like your alpha knocking going, ah, that's a good thing to bump up against. You're afraid for a reason. Hello. Remember uh, Back to the Future? Hello, McFly. Are you in there? <laughs> what if it's your alpha going, yeah, sure. Great pain. Love it. Take two scoops. Right? What if it's your chance to be better in this moment right now in all of time? No goals. Right? It's about habits. People go, well, you know, I'm going to give a seminar on goals. Oh, please. Right? Go, 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 pulling you outside the moment. But I've found it to be the same people that will give you a class on goals are the same people quoting uh, Batoli, Power of Now, right? Or Technahan quoting uh, Be Here Now. They're busy quoting, telling you to be here now, but it's always a carrot at the end of the stick. And I like the concept, if you're going to hone your head, you're going to hone your heart, you're going to hone your spine, it's the habit of standing up to what you're afraid of. It's your habit of confronting pain and going, is that all you brought? That's as pain. <laughs> that's as rough as you. The, wait a minute. You're telling me that that amount of brutal was enough to knock me down, you think? Really? Nah. No. You need to go home and get some more guys. So for for the people listening, this, <laughs> I, I, I posed the question because I, did not expect you to answer that way, and I Sorry, absolutely brother. love that because then you made me, you, you always make me think, which I greatly appreciate, which is why I immediately said this is definitely a conversation I want to have with you, Brian. Thank you, brother. I, I pose the question to everyone of what are you doing to intentionally mm -hmm. challenge yourself mm -hmm. each day? What are you doing to intentionally suffer each but day? Tony Robbins has the quote, pain is inevitable, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Isn't well, true? you can seek out the suffering because let me tell you, Brian, the last few months before the new year, like maybe, you know, before December 20th or whatever, I was feeling a bit lackluster with myself <laughs> because I've been in this pattern for about the last five years, ever since I got myself into shape from being this extremely overweight guy <laughs> in my early twenties. But the pattern was, I would be 210 pounds and then I'd go down to 195 pounds. Then I go back to 210, 195. It was this constant fluctuation within this small window where I never got fat, but I was unhappy with myself because I kept asking myself the question, why do I keep allowing myself to get back to this place that I don't want to be at? And I recognized about myself, I don't feel good unless I am working my body every single day in some capacity. I don't feel good if I just go to the gym three days a week. I can maintain my level of fitness sure. with that, but I don't feel great about sure. it. I, like even the, the times that I'm least happiest in my life are the times when I'm least challenged. They are the mm -hmm. times when I'm not working on something. I had a conversation with someone on the broadcast recently, great conversation that had merit of its own, but I disagreed with one thing that this individual mentioned and I pushed back and we had a great conversation, but she mentioned this very successful individual that everyone knows out there and she's like this person i can tell is probably overworking themselves and they're probably mm -hmm. unhappy mm -hmm. and i found that to be a giant assumption because i said well let me push back on that if this person stopped going after the next thing building the next business doing the next thing going 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 they would probably be more unhappy than if they continue to build, if they continue to do, if they continue to intentionally find ways to challenge themselves. And she was like, yes, I see what you're saying. However, and she gave her own reasons. Mm -hmm. But I know just from personal experience, and I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are, I am most happy when I am seeking discomfort in one shape, way, or form on a daily basis. Well, I, that's what I love about the name of your show, Be Better. Be better at the questions you ask yourself. Be better. And here's, and it all comes down because people come, well, how are we going to do it? How are we going to mortal up? Which is why I trademarked the idea after all these years and, and started talking about the Alpha Restoration Program, blah, 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 right? All this stuff. But what does it come down to? Don't buy the book, right? Here you go. Here's the entire book for free. Be better at standing in front of the mirror, asking it a question, and then I'm going to say this because people will go, there's impossible for Brian to be quiet. Stand there in front of your mirror, look yourself in the eyes, ask it the question and be quiet. Have the courage for your mirror to answer you. 
But so many people are busy. I saw now. It look, just happens to be the same guy. So I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do the uses the shoe polishes hair dye right because <laughs> all the money in the world is not going to make this guy happy. But you know, da -da 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 -da, puts a post up the other day that says, "Oh well, a true friend is someone when you're doing half a push up tells you how great you're doing." <laughs> no, that's a gaslighter. That's, that's a, a gaslighter. Quote. Yeah, I was like, what? Really? Right? What? Uh, uh, right? That's someone gaslighting you, telling you, oh, it'll be okay. Well, what if it's not going to be okay? Life, I say this all the time. People say, oh, well, you know, Mother Nature cares for you. It's been my experience. In the coldest, 50 below zero in Yellowstone, 120 some odd degrees in Death Valley, mosquitoes uh, with a 400 bite rate kayaking in the Everglades. It's been my experience that if you're waiting for Mother Nature to take care of you, she's, oh, she's going to hold it. I remember a particular lady who owned a big motivational company. I won't say her name because we got in a fight about it, but uh, she's gone on. So technically, she's smarter than me, right? She knows what the answer, the ultimate answer to life and death is. But she would say, oh, you know, nature holds you in the palm of her hand. And I go, look, it's been my experience. If she's holding it in the palm of your hand, you're holding in the palm of your hand, she's waiting to get her other hand around your throat. Nature <laughs> doesn't, look, nature is betting on one guy with a sperm. Here's the disclaimer, right? We, we said <laughs> one guy with sperm to hook up with one girl with an egg and crossing the finish line. If that doesn't work, nature's going to go back and bet on the cockroaches. And for people that go, oh, that's horrible. Shows you don't know history. Shows you don't know geology. Shows you don't know the theory of evolution or whatever it is. But saying that Mother Nature is doing anything other than gunning for you means you're not paying attention to hurricanes, tornadoes, ice storms, brownouts, blackouts, blah, 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 blah. So what you can control is how are you going to respond? How are you going to out-brutal the brutal? When you look in the mirror and the mirror goes... You've convinced yourself you're A or B and nice job with the hair dye. When you've convinced yourself, oh, man, don't I look great? And the mirror goes, no, it's all a facade, <laughs> right? You can't sit alone in a room for two minutes without worrying about what your next goal, your next carrot on the end of the stick. And it's been my experience in talking to people uh, on their deathbed. I don't like the term deathbed, right? But talking to people who are fairly astute at realizing they're in their final moments, where, uh, however they're sitting, lying, yeah. talking, walking, whatever. And they'll say, yeah, I wish I had spent more time with my family, or I wish I, I wish I had spent more time doing things that I really loved. I wish I had spent more time asking the question of the mirror and having the courage to shut up long enough to have the mirror respond. Because yeah. when you do, your alpha talks to you and goes, look, this isn't your destiny. And here's another thing. People confuse all the time destiny and fate. For me, destiny is what you're here to do. Right? And, and, and whether you were born to do it or you cultivate a sense of understanding when you get to a certain age, destiny is what you're here to do. Fate is everything that tries to chop block you. Fate is everything that tries to ruin you as a conduit of that destiny. And not yeah. to go all quantum physics on you, but anyone that says, oh, that's not true, well, I, I would... <laughs> read a little bit of quantum physics, right? That we are all a collapse of the wave function. That when you look at us at the cellular level, there's more space than there is anything else, right? And when you understand that, what can fate do to you? It's only what you can do to yourself, right, brother? Yeah, and we, we talked about the idea that people can be living their life for years and years and years and years, but they decided to end their life philosophically years ago. Years so ago. They've, been, they've been living the same life for 30 years, 40 years. They just haven't ended the life by, physically, biologically, right? And my wife is uh, hospice care, social worker. Hmm. Oh, she's wow. been doing that for the last few years, and she's, she's very good at it. And she, she sees people in their last moments, like what you mentioned, every single day of her life. And I, we have a lot of conversations, obviously, not too many because she doesn't want to work while she's not working. Right, sure. But, uh, she, I asked her, I said, you know, what percent of people they, that are in those last moments are peaceful about the way that they're leaving the world, right? Because a lot of these people are quite literally in their deathbed, a lot of the people she speaks to. And it's about half and half. Half of the people are very peaceful about the way that they're leaving the world. Mm. They're not living with regrets. They're not living with, oh, I wish I did this. I wish I did that. But the other half is experiencing that emotion of fear, the emotion of uncertainty, the emotion of I'm not ready to go. And so, by the way, some of these people are younger people, 30, 
40, which, Mm -hmm. you know, 50, even Mm -hmm. 60 is pretty damn young. But some of these people, even in their 80s, 90s, and sometimes 100, they're still saying, I'm not happy with the way things are going. They're extremely anxious in those final moments, which is the last Mm -hmm. thing that I'd want to be. Right. Right. It's about half and half. So I I have a couple of questions based on what you said. Um, The first one is, okay, well, if we really are here biologically to donate our sperm to further the human race, right? Mm-hmm. That's really what we're here to do. Before language right. was here, it's cave men, cave women. We're meant to to procreate and right. continue the human race. But now it's very different. Now we've got the Amazon drones. We've got we've got everything else. We've got language. We've got culture. Where is meaning where does mm-hmm. does meaning come the from question. the intentional seeking of the suffering of the challenge like what is meaning and where where does it come from well let me ask you this brother if you if if you uh, spend or do you golf by any chance? A, a couple you, times. I'm, yeah, but I'm, I'm, you're like me. Here. You're not all that good at all. Okay, but <laughs> you and I spend uh, five hundred dollars on a driver. Is that is that a, a, a lot of money for a driver now? Five hundred. I don't know. Maybe a thousand. Let's say we spend twenty five hundred dollars on a driver, and then we take it home, and we hang a nail in the wall to put a picture up with it. <laughs> Terrible misuse <laughs> of the tool. So, yeah. and I, I can't wait to talk. I hope one day that she won't consider it an extension of her already many hours at work. I'd love to talk to your wife. Are the people that say I'm tranquil, which I love that word, right? That's an alpha word. I, I know I, people will disagree with that, but tranquil is an okay. alpha world as opposed yeah. to triggered, as opposed to everything in the outside world. Oh, I need safe spaces. I need protected. I need empathy and this and that. But suppose that the people are very tranquil or like, I did exactly what my alpha told me to do. Right? I did exactly. I was absolutely the conduit for my own destiny. And I would be fascinated to know, maybe there's no way of ever knowing, but I, wouldn't, you be, wouldn't you be fascinated to know, are the percentage of people that die tranquil, are they like, man, I burned this thing at both ends of the candle. I mm. ran through life. Every moment, my goal was to be better in that moment. And I think what happens, brother, when you look, and I'm just using the figures now of uh, the midlife crisis and a quarter life crisis. I think it's all about growing up. And again, again, a disclaimer, Brian's opinion, no one else's, right? Blame me, not Brandon, anybody else affiliated with the show. I think a whole lot of people don't grow up. I think there is a rite of passage, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, whatever you want to call it. There's a rite of passage where your alpha is laying in wait. Your alpha is ready for the water wheels, and the, or the training wheels and the water wings and the safety nets to kind of fall away. Like a little Apollo spaceship taken off. It loses its rocket boosters. It loses all of its accoutrement. And then the little capsule goes on and does what it's going to do. I think what happens, and I think why there's a quarter life crisis today, is a lot of people don't have that dark night of the soul. Mm. They're, they're, right? They're, they're, they're sets of walking, talking lips looking for the nipple du jour. Looking for their next getting, right? It's Something pleasure, it's insatiable. Pleasure, 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 pleasure. And they they never jettison those water wings. And they constantly think, and this gets me in trouble because people go, well, empathy is very important. And I go, well, I don't think it's very important at all. Well, kindness is very important. Well, I don't think kindness is important at all unless you have that empathy and that kindness when you look into the mirror. When you sit alone in a room, if you don't have that empathy for the struggle you're in, if you can't show yourself that kindness for what you're up against, that kindness, what it takes to outbrute the brutal, then anything you do outwardly, I don't want to hear. It's it's like a peacock throwing his feathers. Oh, it's very important that we're empathetic. I don't think so. Okay, so so talk to me about that idea yeah. of being in that room facing right. that challenge. Right. I've I've had several clients that I've worked with that have said I'm not ready to look in the mirror yet and say those things, right? I'm not ready to look in the mirror and ask those questions. And me never being in I've never been there before. I've yeah. I've looked in the mirror and have been unhappy. Right. But it always resulted in me doing something about it, right? right. So I've never been able to not look in the mirror, so I can't relate to that. And maybe you'll have an answer for me or an idea or a philosophy. But when you're alone with yourself, what should you be doing in that time? Like when you're, what, what question. questions do you ask when you're looking in the mirror? Like how often are you, Brian, looking right. in the mirror even today? Like what does that process look like? 
Well, listen, I have to tell you that you that you asked me that question. Let me just answer it honestly. I look in the mirror, I see the hair lip uh, that I was born with. I look in the mirror, and I, I joke to you probably. I tell everyone, listen, I have more head scars than Frankenstein, given five brain <laughs> surgeries and all these other things, and cancers, and they're always cutting. So I'm Irish, right? I, I got skin cancer <laughs> like it's Friday night. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm always looking in the mirror. Outside of that... And this is another disclaimer. So all these people that say, well, meditation, it's important to meditate. Well, I don't think it is. Meditation is for those people that don't remember who they ultimately are. You are a great, 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 as we said earlier, a great, great grandchild of the divine. Meditation is designed when your mind is so busy, you're trying to get past all those thoughts. What are you trying to identify? Where the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree where you're the chip off the old block. So when people say, well, when you look in the mirror, what do you think? And I know this is going to sound strange to people because there's a cottage industry now. Oh, you need to show gratitude. I look in the mirror and I'm thankful that I'm able to draw another inhale. Mm. And that's it. I think gratitude without a target, gratitude without an object to be grateful for. I think the overarching sense of just having the opportunity, trillions to one odds, right? And I think you and I have talked before. If, and again, great, 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 great. Right? I'm a big Ancestry fan. Not at all. Not at all. In any <laughs> event, your great, 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 great grandfather decided to play slap and tickle with someone other than your great, 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 great grandmother, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. You wouldn't be here. And then that just says, okay, you're going to get here. Then what are the odds that you've, to be 61, what are the odds that you've survived all the way to 61? With I remember not too long ago in, in Chicago, young lady walking down the street, wind blew a brick, fell like half a mile, hit her. Oh two God. steps either way. She it wouldn't have mattered. You wow. never know when it's good. You never know when you're going to be called home. I say all the time, I'm bulletproof until the divine decides otherwise. When my Kevlar gets called home, I'm out of here, right? But if you don't appreciate that, if what it is that you're grateful for or thankful for isn't your next inhale, you don't understand the word. Right. Yeah, so I was talking to I was just speaking on that because that that brick story blows my mind. I was talking to an ER nurse and uh, she was I, I asked her some of the craziest stories that she's experienced. And one that really stuck out to me was she had an individual come into the ER who they, they were in a coma. They weren't conscious. They were hit by a drunk driver. And mm -hmm. she's like, of course, the drunk drivers never hurt. They're always fine. It's always the person they right. hit. That's her. Uh, the vehicles crushed. The bodies crushed. This individual ended up waking up from the coma without an arm and a leg, right? They don't even know what happened. All of a sudden, everything went black. They wake up, no arm, no leg. And it made me think, oh my God, like what a freak thing. We all drive every day. I drive 40 minutes a day at least. Like we're, we're all in these situations where at any moment our <laughs> life can change in any second, yep. right? So yep. that just, it, it just makes me think like every moment, like having gratitude Yes. Without the object of I'm so grateful for my cat. I'm so grateful for my car. And then, you know, feeling that. Right. Way, what if you're just grateful to be in this state yes. that you're in? And you're in. In this moment. In right this now. moment. In all of time. You know, I, I said to my wife, we were driving uh, north for uh, the holidays. And uh, there's a big sign. 290 some odd people have died on Ohio highways this season. Well, those are 290 people that planned on the exit that they were going to get off. To, they had a goal. They had a goal. A goal. They, they had just signed up for a goal-setting seminar and, and a master class on how to set goals. And their goal was to get to a widget store 10 miles down the road, take this exit. Oh, thank God I had that goal seminar. They had a goal of getting there. Well, guess what? 290 people didn't make it. So... Right? Your friend or the, the, uh, the emergency room nurse made me think of when I came out of what was my second surgery uh, for the tumor. Uh, the guy in the room next to me, right? You go in and there are two bays. So the doctor apparently, right? Like a Ginsu knife. The doctor operates. Okay, move him one to B. Doctor operates, move this one to A. Well, the guy next to me that got moved in, he died. So as soon as I was conscious, as soon as I was able, I made them wheel my table over to where his family was standing around. And I felt a tremendous sense of, of survivor's guilt, let's say. But I remember thinking, why him and not me? Mm. 
So the people that are in that situation, and when they go, well, you look in the mirror, you're thankful. I'm thankful for my next exhale. I'm thankful that I'm even able to stand and look into a mirror. I'm thankful. And then the list ends, brother. <laughs> you know, people say, well, you need, to, you, need to, you need to make 10. Before you fall asleep, list 10 things that you're thankful for. I, I list inhale nine times. Exhale is the 10th. <laughs> inhale, 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 exhale. There you go. I'm good. I can go to sleep now. I, there's my 10 things I'm thankful for. So I, I completely yeah. understand what you say about the idea of goals. Completely <laughs> get it. At the same time, when I look at someone like you, yes, you challenge yourself frequently. You challenge yourself daily. You also have a goal. Even if you don't say, well, my goal is to reach 542 people by noon today. Your goal is what we're doing right now. If you didn't have a goal, Brian, right. you're doing what you did right. right now, your goal is to continue your journey. Help right. maybe how blessed would it be to help even just one person who right. listens to this and says, Wow, I never wow. thought of it like that. And then boom, right. their life changes, they go and help other lives. So you do, in a sense, mm -hmm. have a goal, but not even just a goal, but the idea of you have a compelling future. It's not like you're doing nothing. You have this purpose and mission that mm -hmm. you are living with your life, which has brought you to this point. And I can only imagine where I'll bring in the next two decades, three decades. You, but like you do have a compelling future. You do have a goal. Would you agree with that or, or would you spin it a different way? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I would spin it. I would say that I'm terribly, and again, this probably comes from my time in a cave on Wudong Mountain in China. Uh, the Tao follows its own path. Uh, thy will be done. Or, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. 23rd Psalm, for thou art with me. Or if you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you're of the Islamic faith, you'll say, inshallah, if Allah wills. I have a belief in that being a conduit for that destiny is to listen to that still small voice in my head. And I'm here today, thanks to your graciousness, I'm here today <laughs> because that voice told me that this is where I'm supposed to be. So if you're saying to me, Brad, you have a goal. My goal is always, now that you asked me, that's a great way of, of framing the question. My goal is to always listen to that still small voice. My goal is to make certain that when that ruach, as I understand it, now that's not a goal of like, oh, I think I'll have a three- egg omelet when I get done here. That's a different voice, right? That's a, well, and we'll get into, maybe we'll have time, I, I don't know, but we'll get into the difference between the ego and the alter ego. Now, your alter ego is what happens to your alpha when there's supposed to be a chain of the command and, the is, and there isn't. The ego usurps its authority, right? And it says, I'm in charge. I'm going to be a human getting for the rest of your life. I know what's going on. And it doesn't surrender the throne to your alpha. And your alpha becomes your alter ego. And I have to tell you, Kobe Bryant, was instrumental in helping me with this because he would talk about the mamba. He would he would say I needed some, he was his terms were I needed some distance. Well, what he needed distance from was the ego, the getting this. He said I needed to channel my inner mamba in whatever I was doing, and that's the alpha. It becomes the alter ego because the ego is doing everything it can to beat it up, which I think is what happens to an individual successfully completing their thought that a biological suicide will be good for them. They're beaten up by their thoughts. They can't hear that still small voice. They can't hear that whisper and that well, getting that keeps small, hammering. Is that the divine? That that's, small divi voice? that's absolutely the divine. And you could say, oh, Brad, it's too religious. Then great. Then let's talk quantum physics for those of you that are, are into it. That quantum physics is there's an energy. There's a buried logic. There's an authentic vigor that fuses Every cell in your body that I call it divine may be the wrong term, but it doesn't negate the fact that it's still there, right? Yeah. You think your dad's sperm needed your encouragement to keep swimming? Yeah. Right? What? 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 No. Yeah. So that energy, that force, I, I, I tend to think that we live in the labyrinth. I call it the labyrinth of life. Up, down, left, right, pivot or swerve. When you're listening to that voice, you have no idea where you're going to end up at the end of the day. But what you have is the courage to listen to that voice. Listen to your gut instinct. Listen to your alpha trying to regain control of the throne that the ego took 
Just like a, a third world dictator, the ego who wants you getting, 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 getting. Well, if you're busy getting, you're going, this life's pretty good. Amazon just dropped me off some cheese and crackers. <laughs> well, what if those cheese and crackers aren't good for you? Whatever it is, your alpha is doing everything it can to get your attention. That's what gut instincts are. And that's why people are depressed. Think about the word depression. Your alpha is depressed, right? Mm-hmm. Your alpha is depressed. It's pressed down inside of you. It may be dormant, but it's not dead. So when people go, there's got to be more out of life. It's because they're tired of the ego running the show. There's well, got to, right? Talk about that. Well, let's yeah. talk about the ego. The question I have for you, the, the first pre-question is, have you ever have you ever had a psychedelic experience with, uh, with psilocybin, with LSD, anything like that? I, the, the very, very short answer is no, I haven't because I think of my desire to want to let the mirror answer me back. Does that make sense? Tell, uh, what, what do you mean yeah. by that? Tell me more. Um, so I is think, it a conscious effort you've taken not to do those things or you just haven't no, found yourself in the situation? I haven't found myself in that situation yet. And I read all the accounts. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of great books out there about how many people have been doing. And there's people today. You listen to Joe Rogan. You listen yeah. to Marcus, somebody or other, Marcus, somebody. And uh, you were the, uh, yeah, not Marcus. Well, <laughs> that's right. The very, the very stoic. He probably would have had a great yeah, But now, some so. guy is writing a book. I don't know. It's Marcus. He owns uh, the club company, the I'm kettlebell sure. company. I don't know who it is. Yeah. Marcus well BMD. I don't know who it is. But in any event, you listen to these accounts and Hannah's accounts. You listen to the accounts and I'm hard pressed to believe that it's anything other than making the ego move to the side. That's it. Yes. And you connect to that field. Yes. And again, we go back to quantum physics. Everyone, look, everyone will say, I posted the other day, thy will be done and got hammered for it. Someone goes, well, we didn't know you were religious. Hold on. Thy will be done. Inshallah. The Tao follows its own path. Pick whatever poison you like, right? Pick whatever you like. Quantum physics says that you and I are a collapse of the wave function. Transactional interpretation of quantum uh, of quantum physics, quantum mechanics. We're like a handshake. We're transacting. And in that moment you transact, you find yourself here. Collapse of the state vector. Other people will probably recognize. But you are a part of that field. You are a part of that web. So when I say Holy Spirit, H-O-L-Y, or Holy Spirit, W-H-O-L-L-Y, I couldn't care less what you think. I really, I, 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 I couldn't care less about your opinion of whether there's a Holy Spirit or a Holy Spirit. You should. But I am in no way, shape, or form interested in what you feel in that regard. You come to that of your own. And I say that, I, I, and this is a little bit of a side, but you know, people say, well, I can't believe how heartless, <laughs> how heartless it is to self people. You don't care about their feelings. Well, I don't. And the reason I don't care about their feelings is I don't care about my own feelings. Look, after five brain surgeries in two and a half years, there's plenty of times I don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning. I don't feel like getting into a cold shower. I don't feel like doing the push-ups. I don't feel like doing a ton of stuff. But I have the habit. I have the grit. Except on Sundays. I like to say I let my grit simmer on Sundays. Um, <laughs> I have the habit of going, I'm going to do it even if it doesn't feel good to me. Yeah. So when people go, well, I can't believe you You don't care about other people's feelings. Couldn't care less only because I couldn't care less about mine. I listen to that still small voice. I listen to my gut. I listen to the instinct, the intuition, the alpha. And then if it's something that I think is going to hurt, I feel it isn't. I feel it's going to be discomforting. I can tell you, December 25th here, it was six below zero. You get in a cold shower on the day that the water is moved through the pipes out in the yard and it's six below zero. I'm like, well, let me come up. There's got to be some kind of great excuse not to get in the shower. <laughs> well, I don't feel like get in there and freeze. Oh, the dog needs walked. Oh, I, I left the oven on. Oh, I need to run to the store and get some stamps. Right? We come up with, that's the ego going, oh, you don't want this pain. The reason why, the ego knows when you successfully square your shoulders, when you lead with your chin, when you say, yeah, I turn the other cheek. Because the third punch, my punch, is the one that's going to end this little brawl. When you lead with your chin, the ego knows it doesn't have control over you anymore. There's no fear because you're going back to the field that gave you birth. Yes, sir. 
the, the question I have, and I have some a, a quick story afterwards because I, I didn't I didn't understand what the ego was until I didn't have the ego during a psychedelic <laughs> experience. Oh, great! And I know some people roll their eyes at that and they're like, "Oh, here we go," but it's <laughs> it's true, and, and, and I'll explain the best way I can with, with the words that I have. But the question I'm going to have for you is, how can we? without a psychedelic experience. Right. Remove the ego so that we can make that still still quiet voice even louder. But to give you an example, I remember I, I won't go into the full story because I think I've told a little bit about it. But I didn't tell I about this it. one part because it's it's kind of it's kind of weird. I did a psychedelic experience with a friend of mine. It was a full day event. It was about eight, eight, nine hours. Uh, we started at noon. It's now seven PM. It was an amazing experience. It was three and a half grams. No four I'm sorry, four and a half grams of magic. Great. Mushroom. All right. And it was it was probably one of the best experiences of my entire life after getting married to my beautiful wife. Right, of course, as one as right, of course. <laughs> so I soon to be mom. Yeah, no, yes. exactly. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. If I thank you, I appreciate. That. That. I'm sure thank I you. had my list to the long. You've already given me much great advice, oh. and I'm sure there's more to come too. Which is, which is I would listen to me. I've been saying I would listen to me. So my <laughs> wife picks me up at 7 p.m. She brings me home. Right, I'm still. I don't want to use the word tripping because it really wasn't. I'm still in a deep sense of peace, right? Mm -hmm. There was a moment in that experience because when you do a heroic dose of psychedelics of any kind, it, you experience what a lot of people call ego death. And I didn't mm -hmm. know that. And I was oh, like, wow. that's interesting. I'm curious to see what that is. So it is true. Like at one point, I'm a talkative person. I always want to talk. I always want to fill the space. There was a moment where I was like, I don't need to talk. There's no right. words that need to be said. I don't right. need to fill any space. It's Everything is fine sure. the way that it is. I kept getting this, this gnawing, gnawing understanding and knowingness that nothing in life is urgent. Nothing's urgent. I kept getting this understanding that everything is going to be okay. Everything mm -hmm. is okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I kept having this understanding of you're okay. Mm -hmm. So do more for others. You're okay. Mm -hmm. So do more for others. Help others. Yep. That was when I first really tuned in to that quiet voice. So that's why mm -hmm. when you say that, I understand what you're saying. Whether mm -hmm. you want to call it the divine or God or whatever anyone wants to call it. It's gravity. That, gravity. Yeah. Call yeah. it what you like. Yeah. It's that knowingness. Yep. And I remember I'm home now. It's 7.30 p.m. I'm still in this state of peace. Like I'm moving around. I'm showering. I'm doing all these things. And I go out there and I sit down with my wife. And that ego is still gone and she's watching TV. And all of a sudden, I just have this sense of love wash over my entire body. And I'm right. bawling next to my wife now. I'm right. crying. Right. And she looks over and she's like, are you crying? And I was yeah. like, I can't help it. And she's like, what are you crying about? And she's laughing now. She's funny. And she thought this was a, a hoot, this whole experience. Right. And I said to her, I just looked at her and I said, I've been so selfish. And she's like, what are you talking about? I said, I've just yeah. been so selfish. I've been, been me, me, me. And right. she's like, babe, you've got your show. You, you've got, you, you love helping clients. You do so many things. And it's like, no, like I did a lot of that for myself. Sure. Right. And I have a knowing sure. this that I have just been thinking about me, 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 my own preservation, my own, you know, my own self, not other people. When really I know what I need to do is to focus on other people and help other people. And in that moment, I was like, I understand the meaning of life. In that moment, I knew. And then you wake up the next day and right. you're back in your normal. Right. 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 And I wrote down, I took notes, and I, I always Good. think back to that experience of. That moment where I knew the ego was gone, the sense of I right. need to take care of me, I need to hunt, I need to gather. Right. When that was gone, the only thing I was right. left with was what can I do for other right. people, right? right? So I have tuned into that quiet voice. But for, for those people, and by the way, Stanford University recently did a study where they took 30 – they took a group of people for 30 days and they did psychedelic, it sounds weird, but psychedelic experiments. Like they, mm -hmm. they, they gave these individuals psychedelics of some sort. You can read the study, look it up on Stanford. They found that after 30 days, over 50% of the people in that study showed no quote unquote signs of depression. Mm -hmm. So the question mm -hmm. is, right? that ego gone, with them being able to tune into that voice, for everyone right. else who, you know, they don't want to do psychedelics or they don't right. have the means or the opportunity or whatever it might be, like, how can people right. strengthen that quiet voice and tune into it, Brian? 
Well, that's I'm. I, if you will ever share your notes, I would love to read what you wrote. <laughs> right, I would love that. Uh, I would say that qu very, very quickly. Uh, two times I was hospitalized during um, my five brain surgeries. I was hospitalized for what's called transglobal amnesia. No clue who I was. Zero zip zilch. But I went through the movements. I went through the nomenclature. But I had no idea uh, idea who I was. I had no idea that I had a brain tumor. I had no my idea my mom had died. I had no idea that I had moved to another state why my wife wasn't right there. And my brain would repeat every 15 seconds. Like, I would go, hey, Ashley, how are you? Oh, I'm great, baby. How are you? Hey, Ashley, how are you? Mm. I'm great, baby. How are you? Hey. I, so my mind wouldn't leave this loop. But what I realized was I was still fine. Took a shower, got something to eat, got dressed. Granted, I tried to get out of the car while it was moving, right? There's a little bit to that. So I was driven somewhere. I drove without car door. But I had lost all sense of something, and but I was fine. And I think, Brandon, when you talk about do good for others, the others is simply the recognition of the underlying field. So when you say go out and do good for others, it's 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 not a, a, a another ego that you need to good, do good for. I believe that sense of doing good for others. What is it? Uh, namaste. Uh, I recognize. I think it's from the Hindu religion. Namaste. I recognize that point in you where you and the divine are one. Mm. Are one. That's the spark. That's the alpha. That makes you the satellite office. The acorn not falling far from the tree. The chip off the old block. You are that divinity. And I think when it says be kind to others, you're recognizing the quantum field, right? You're recognizing the source of dark energy and dark matter and gravity and black holes and the weak and the strong nuclear forces. I tend to think, it's a big topic now, years ago when I read uh, Chick Mahai's book on flow, Stephen Cutler does a big thing with it now, but flow, I don't think it's something you get into. I think flow is one of the natural forces of the universe. And your depression blocks you from that flow. I think when you're a conduit for your destiny, you are flow. Well, how about some triggers for flow? I don't think you need to be triggered. I think you need to get out of your own way. There was a reason when Moses was confronting the burning bush that the divine says to Moses, take off your shoes. <laughs> right? Now you could say, well, Brian, it's obvious because the electrodes in the earth are important for the human body. It helps beat back this and that. <laughs> Could very well be. But it also removes a block between you and the earth. It, blew, it, it, it removes the block between you and the field, right? Which is why I say all the time, there's dirt in your DNA. Don't be afraid of getting dirty. Don't be afraid of climbing a tree. Don't be afraid of going out, lying on the grass in your boxers when the rain is falling. Or the My kids were th couldn't believe that I went out in a recent snowstorm just in boxers, laid down and waited for the snow to melt under my body so it looked like I made a snow angel. They couldn't, they couldn't understand. So for me, I would suggest that you at that point, and you started to cry, and you say, oh, your wife had said, oh, you always do good for others. You never escape, brother, the recognition that you are a collapse of the wave function. You are a part of that field. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, don't care how you spell it, you are it, regardless of the ego's attempt to hijack you, right? Regardless of the ego's attempt. And you remember the bank robbers in Stockholm. Um, we call it the Stockholm Syndrome today where people uh, bond tremendously, fall in love with their captors. So much so, when you study the story of the Stockholm bank robbery, the, the victims, the people that had been kidnapped, spoke in defense of the bad guys at trial. So you and I developed the Stockholm Syndrome for our ego, because it's easy. Our egos make sure there's a, a pop in the fridge when we want one. Our egos make sure we're driving the car that we want. Our egos make sure that the lights don't go off there in the interview. Our egos make certain of all of this. So we build a sense of rapport with the one thing that's killing us. Mm. That still small voice, the alpha, which is the only reason I'm doing Friday Night Firelight, I believe sitting by the fire reminds us all of our ancestors taking that first step. Garden of Eden, savannas of Africa, don't care. You might want to. I couldn't care less. You take that first step. At the end of the day, they sat by a fire, licking their wounds, 
recounting the stories of the day, figuring out what it was going to take to make it through the night. And this is with hyenas and leopards and lions and elephants stumbling through. So for me, sitting by the fire, Friday Night Firelight is designed to remind people who they ultimately are outside of the ego. It's my way of having a psychedelic experience wow. uh, for the people watching me, just like you did, brother, by saying, let the fires melt away. Let the, let the smoke strip away the hold because the ego plays you like a puppet. I love, people say all the time, well, look at these cell phones. Look at it. Yeah, we're tied to them. The ego goes, there's a ding. I, I'm sorry, Brandon, could you, could you wait one minute? Look, I'm just going to check my phone. Somebody just rang me. So if you don't mind, I'd like to stop our interview, right? Magnified a moment now, a bunch of bunk. Let me see who got a hold of me. It's the greatest meditation tool in the world. People go, don't you hate cell phones? No. Why? Because you learn to ignore them. Well, the phone's ringing. Couldn't give a shit. Oh, sorry. Couldn't give a crap. Oh, you just got a ding. You, you have a thumbs up on LinkedIn. Couldn't care less. I think it's the greatest meditation tool because it causes you, like you did in your psychedelic experience, it causes you to turn away from the ego that goes, oh man, I don't know. You should take that incoming Facebook like somebody loves you. Somebody's so, got empathy so for you. Ask you <laughs> and, and I'll ask you from my own perspective because okay. that's probably the only way I can ask it. Sure, why not? If that quiet voice, the way that I was perceiving it was, help other people, hmm? but really it's to connect with source, you know, yes, sir. you know, connect the divine, serve yes, the sir. divine, support more yes, life. Yeah. Then what, how do you perceive that in terms of how, how can I support, not necessarily help other people, but how can right. I support more of life? Well, I would say recognizing that in other people, they just not you and me, right? They too are a chip off the old block. They too are the great, 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 great child of the divine. So you want to do good for the divine, be it God or be it gravity right? The universe, holy or Holy Spirit, being good to that person, namaste. You're worshiping that portion where that other person and God are one. You're not, you know, it goes back to the thing, oh, how does this shirt, does this shirt make me look heavy? Well, I expect my wife to say, yes, it makes you look heavy. Don't lie to me. So you go, oh no, you, you look great. You look great. And then you go out and everyone looking at you going, <laughs> look at that, a God loaded himself in that sweater, <laughs> right? So the ego wants the accoutrement. It wants the bling, the knickknacks, the baubles. But when you go, I want to help these other people, you're saying, I want to help a collapse of the wave function. I want to help, not the ego that says, oh, they need to drive a whatever. I need to help that $2,500 driver that they are. They're a satellite office of the divine, however you define it. So for me, when it came to studying all those years ago, my father's suicide, you still have that voice. It may be dormant, but it's not dead. But all the other voices of the ego gang up on you. It's too painful. Well, what if your higher authority, right? Your alter ego now, born your alpha, became your alter ego because it went underground when your, when your ego started a, a, a burn and destroy mission, right? Because it didn't want to give up authority. So it becomes your alter ego. Your alter ego goes... I just can't do this anymore. No, it doesn't. It never says that. The alter ego is the little voice that says, you're damn right you'll st draw your line in the sand. You'll confront this evil. You're damn right ignore all those voices. And uh, I think it'll take another 37. I won't be here, right? Uh, it'll take another 37 years, if not, to go, is it all the voices of the ego, do they drown out that still small voice? Do they bully it into submission? Because I don't believe it ever leaves you. I believe that's the spark um, that returns to the universe. I don't believe it's ever ultimately tapping out. It's all the voices around it that call for it to tap out. And in that moment, when you read the accounts of people that have jumped, uh, 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 for any tried to kill themselves in any way, and they go, in that last moment, I'm glad it didn't work. That's the reassertion of the alpha to the throne, right? No longer has to be the alpha ego. Like you, you came home and cried. Doesn't matter anymore. Don't care what other people think about me. Think what you like. Yeah. That, I think, is the difference between someone that ultimately commits suicide. And for those of us, since we're talking today about philosophical suicide, follow your heart. Follow your gut. Right? People say, oh, you got to follow your passion. Just make sure it's your gut. We can be we can be passionate about football. I'm never going to kick. I'm never going to kick field goals to win the Super Bowl. 
Follow your gut. What will that voice say when all the other voices in your head are told to leave it alone? I want to hear what this says. And I will tell you, when you confront pain, when you decide to out, you ask me, how do you do this? When you decide to out brutal the brutal, when you decide to jump into that ice barrel, when you decide to crack the ice on the Alum Creek and you decide to jump in, the ego goes, the ego's scared to death. You'll remember who you really are who you ultimately are, scared to death, literally scared to death, right? Because it knows it will die the moment you take the magic mushrooms. The moment you out brutal the brutal, the ego's hold begins to loosen and it's scared to death that it will happen because it knows when you hit rock bottom and you pick yourself back up through resilience, regret, uh, grit, when you pick yourself back up and you let your alpha run the show from the darkest place it could be, from that moment on, the ego knows it lost. It's an arm wrestling match, and the ego just lost it, is my interpretation of it. Wow. I've what really, you did through? I, I really enjoyed this conversation, brother. And I, I could talk to you for another hour, and uh, I just don't have the time right That's now. Okay. No, not to worry. I appreciate it. I appreciate but, it. But we will, because there's so much. I mean, this whole conversation about ego and you know everything, I, I, I hope and I know this will help just one person. Right. Well, it's and, all, and we'll might, go all might, Emerson. You know, saying, yeah. I hope yeah. it helps a person. Right. So, yeah. so again, you know, we did this. If it makes a difference, it makes a difference. And uh, a big part of me believes that it will. But I, I yeah. know a lot of people are going to be like, okay, what is this Friday night firelight? Yeah. You've been doing this for quite a while. Right? I'm just starting it. We, we're going to kick it off February 3rd. It is okay. going to be a live interview or type thing. It's going to be live shot in front of of the Firebugs, a company called Firebugs uh, is helping me with the fire pit and we'll be cooking nutrient survival food. We'll be, you know, kind of like going back to our primal, what it was like in that moment. And you're going to record this live. It's live, yeah. I'm hoping people will go, here's me sitting by the fire. Here's my fire pit. They're going to be able to call in and take, uh, we'll take questions. We'll learn from each other. We'll do everything we can to figure out how to let the, what will the flame say to you? It's a lot like the mirror, really, Brandon, now that I think about it, your question. It's a lot like the mirror. What will the flame say to you if you sit there long enough and let them have their way with you? Let them have their say. And that's what I hope Friday Night Firelight is, is the ability of people to tune in, show me how they connect with their alpha, and then we come up maybe with some tips, some tricks, some tools, right, on how to out-brutal the brutal, how to eat, how to cook over an open fire, mm -hmm. how to bushwhack, how to survive, all those things. I'm thrilled to death. I can't wait. And even my wife said to me, she goes, well, it's just like a regular Friday night for you. And I go, yeah, right? I love it. I love camping out. I love survive. I, I love all of it. I love the preparation of it all. So we'll be doing Friday Night Firelight starting February 3rd and it'll be broadcast live to a YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, we invite everyone to tune in and show me your fireplace. Show me the how Mortal you do up. Mortal Up. Mortal Up, yes. Channel. Mortal Up. And, and again, I would say the, the Mortal Up is just remember who you ultimately are. Mortal Up is about digging deep, remembering the alpha that you were born before socialization got to you, right? Before everyone wanted you to act a certain way to fit in. I'll leave with a question. What if you weren't built to fit in, brother? What if you were built to make a difference? What if you were built? People say, oh, I want to stand out. Other people say, I just like being in the crowd. That's all ego. Whether you stand out, you're still telling people you're standing out. Or whether you're a member of the crowd, you're still telling people you're a member of the crowd. What if you were put here to be different? What if you were put here to be better? And that better is how you square your shoulders with the moment at hand, come what may. Good, bad, and different. People say, are you an optimist? No. Optimist, please. Are you a pessimist? No. I'm an isist. Whatever the moment brings, that's what I'm thankful for. Because I know the alpha will rise to the challenge. It might. It doesn't have to be optimistic. Doesn't have to be pest. Doesn't have to be good. Doesn't have to be bad. It just is. And I'm going to drink is with both hands and figure out how I'm going to outbrutal the brutal. That's. I guess I would leave it with that. If I still had that time, do I even? Did I even have time to say that? <laughs> you, you said it. I love it, that brother. Thank good. you for this. Thanks, awesome brother, for everything. Really excited to see Friday Night Firelight, February first. First one, guys. 
go follow Brian's YouTube channel. That's not why he's here. He's not here to talk about that. I, I follow it. Don't follow it. Right. Curious. I'm going to be following it. <laughs> Thank so you. I'm going to have it in the description so you can, you Thank can you. do so yourself. Cause that's, I've never, never seen anything like that. And uh, it's bringing us back to the, the tribes, right? It's I'm hoping so. The, yes. The and the tribe. Together. Yes, sir. And the tribe being, what is it? It's the field. It's the quantum wave. Yeah. It's the holy H O L Y spirit. It's the, it's where we're all connected. You can argue all you want to about it. We're all connected. The others were kindred. Can't beat it. <laughs> I think it's a great gig. And go to your mirror. Ask your mirror if I'm not telling you the truth. Ask your mirror if Brand is not telling you the truth when he challenges you to be better. Go to your mirror. Let your mirror do the talking. Who the hell cares what I think? Ask your eyes in your own reflection if any of this has been true. Then you'll know. Yes. If you've enjoyed this conversation, if this conversation has helped you, share this conversation with just one other person, one other person who could really use it, and you never know who you might be reaching. Brian, thank you for your time, brother. And, uh, brother, I thank you. To next time, can I give you ten more seconds? Emerson said, "To know even one life is breathed easier. This is to have succeeded. If no, if your people share this, and one other life goes, he sounds nuts, but." My mirror told me I should pay attention. You've already been a success for today. So if your goal today is be a success, help one life breathe easier, and you have already nailed your goal. Sorry, brother. I love that. You heard right. Brian himself. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to hit well, the brother. button See now. Ya. All right. <laughs> Great seeing you guys. I'm Thanks sitting on my hands. Again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.